welcome everyone to Friday Talks. My name is Stuart Levine, and um, I am one of the principals of Society 2045, being fortunate enough to uh, be invited in. And what we are about is seeking positive visions for the year 2045 by bringing pioneering voices together to help um, make future what it is that we want to have happen. So today, our special guest is Aviv Shahar. What I think is, is critical and what uh, had me invite Aviv is that um, he works with a, a, a future perspective. And uh, what I think I'll, I'll, I'll begin the interview is ask Aviv to um, share a little bit about his background and about some of the work that he does. And then we'll, um, we will dig in to some more specifics and hopefully we'll have some good questions as a result of what he has to share today. I've known Aviv for about 20 years. We talked about a little bit about how we first connected and it was also in kind of an, an activist context. But Aviv, please share a little bit about um, your background and the work we're doing in the world, you're doing in the world today. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, second, Stuart, do you know how in Hollywood, in the early days, uh, they wrote scripts chronologically. So if you go to the old movies to like the Ten Commandments, it, it goes chronologically. But then somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, they came up with this innovation where they started uh, writing a non-chronological, non-linear um, scripts. So would it be all right if I first very briefly see some 20, 45 premises and then actually go back and trace my background and, and, and why it is relevant to it? By the way, that may give people watching this at the beginning the reason to stay <laughs> later into the conversations. That Would it be all right if I did it? The floor is all yours. However you think it would be really useful for folks, please go ahead. Beautiful. Well, thank you. So premise... 2045, number one, I, I believe we are experiencing right now a convergence of multiple crises, perhaps a dozen different crises that together create, produce what I believe is what I call the complexity wall. I'm talking about what you all know about the environmental and ecological degradation, about the energy crisis, about the economic crisis in terms of both the uh, forced growth paradigm and the extraction model of the economy. I'm talking about several uh, social and cultural uh, crises, um, including the extraordinary polarization, the haves and have nots, and the tremendous epidemic in loneliness, in depression, child suicide, and you continue these into the leadership void and the geopolitical breakdown we are seeing in terms of institutions. So premise one is we are facing many, many crises, which is why I believe it's beautiful you're framing this in terms of 2045. Premise two, in my trace, I view the convergence of these to be an indication that we are at an end of an epoch. When I tell the full epochal story, I tell the story of the 3,500 years, and I describe those crisis points to represent a, an operating system reaching an obsolescence point, and hence leading us to premise three, which is, could it be that we are actually at, at the early days of a potential transition, major transition, which I believe is what you're all intuiting in the uh, idea of 2045, where the uh, new epochal uh, launch, that is if we don't blow this place up before that, essentially is an invitation to premise four, the rise of the arising of a new human and a new human society. Now I'm perfectly happy to go into depth and details and describe what I believe are the, the five vectors of this major evolutionary change, how can we each play a part inside this change, why I believe what you're doing 
here is, is part of that story. But I thought I'd frame this on the front end as you know, in, in the movies, in the, the this innovation in movies, they give you first a murder in the first 15 seconds, and then the rest of the movie they they trace back to unlock the mystery. So I, I thought I'd, I'd give this as, as an opening. I'm perfectly happy to go back now into tracing my background. Uh, whatever, whatever you think. I mean, my sense was that you were a little bit on a roll here. And so we can always we can always pick up your background a little bit later. Although although what I have found is sometimes a little background adds to credibility in the sense yeah. why why should I listen to this person? You know you know what's their what's their authority? Um, so okay. at, at, as you wish, but I think a little a little background would be good, and then we'll get it. And I can't wait to get into the five vectors. So thank you for okay. teasing me. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the idea. It, it was all about teasing. <laughs> I was trained as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force. And when I served in the Air Force in my mid-20s, I experienced a, a profound internal turmoil. I didn't have at the time the language of an existential crisis or meaning crisis or spiritual crisis. It wasn't necessarily part of my... Uh, framework, but it did, um, it led me ultimately in my mid to late 20s to what can best be described as an initiatory experience in a kind of a modern mystery school journey. So I've now been four, four decades on a journey that forced me to live three lives in parallel. And only in the last seven or eight years, those three journeys truly started to integrate. And the reward and uh, how life blessed me because of that has been so profound, uh, far beyond what I anticipated. So the three lives, the three journeys that I've been on for, for these last uh, four decades, I call life one, the life in the world, that's the entrepreneurial life. And that be started as a, as a fighter pilot in, in the Air Force, but then I was led into the work with leaders and with leadership teams and to consulting in the last few decades with some of the leadership teams in, in some of the most admired companies in the world. And the the two critical insights that shaped my consulting and, and coaching work earlier on was number one, I had an epiphany, which was you could bring the smartest group of people around the table and we were as perfectly capable as any other group in terms of producing collective stupidity. In other words, bright people, not so bright people, we had the perfect capacity to produce collective stupidity. And uh, collective stupidity, by the way, has a technical definition. Collective stupidity is defined as creating a, an output that's not greater than the sum of the individual parts, but actually is lesser, meaning we make each other dumber than we each are on, on our own. That's the technical definition of collective stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I asked the question, why was that? And how could you address that? And I discovered that the way to unlock profound breakthroughs, I actually discovered that to reverse that equation, we need to, to create collective intelligence, to create collective intelligence, we needed to lift the idea of learning from a pedestrian generalized world to a profound insight. What is learning? What is organizational learning? How do, how do we unlock collective learning and collective intelligence? And that was the journey that, that I embarked on in, in that life one, the entrepreneurial life, coupled with a second insight, which was that I discovered that when you ask people about the future, which is what you all are doing here in 2045, there is nothing more exciting and more energizing in engaging people in the inquiry that shapes their future. So I've, I've been more successful than I thought was possible, probably over the last uh, 
seven years or so, been one of the highest paid consultants in, in the country. I, I, if you told me 15 years ago, you could run a solo consulting practice with few projects a year and, and run a seven figure practice, I'd, I'd say you're, you're lying. I didn't think that was possible. Um, it's the integration of that journey with the other two journeys that, that enable that. So that's the, the entrepreneurial uh, journey. What also then happened was that I recognized in my early 20s that when I looked around at the world, I felt that we were living in a kind of what I described to myself back then as a big line. People, too many of the adults looked like they were, um, forgive the expression, dead walking. The, the, the aliveness that I experienced earlier in life and in my teen years that I committed to never forget to remember, what's it like when I grow older? That aliveness of asking the deep questions and of meaning and how things work and, and so on, I saw that becoming dimmer and dimmer and quieter and quieter. So I, I didn't believe that we were meant to live a life like this. And so it set me on this journey of needing to, to create the life within, the, the, in, the internal life. At, the at that time, I didn't have any reference to gestalt therapy, to voice um, dialogue in, internal and, and so on. So I, I, I more stumbled through my journey on the idea of the inner conclave of the part of which you need to do as a life is to harmonize the different parts of you, the inner lives, that, that you are actually not one life, but you're many inner lives, you're a community within or the, the inner conclave. And including with, you know, needing to lead a life in the world, raise a family and so on. And, and that part of my journey um, for about two decades was mostly stress and anxiety and falling on my face and picking myself up, mostly because I, I was so highly aware of how my idealistic notions and the, act, the actual developmental formation, I, I was so highly aware of the opportunity gaps. I, I, I think there are still tremendous opportunity gaps, but I've, I've made peace with a lot of that and I've been able to harmonize so much more of my inner processes and the success in the world and with working at the highest level of business with, with some of the giants in Silicon Valley and, and other large brand names that we all recognize unlocked uh, very much that for me. The third life, which was the always the, the contained, largely secretive life, um, is what I call the universal life. It, it was the pursuit, the inquiry, uh, of a life of meaning and purpose, the, the, the search for communion with the highest sources um, and of, of intelligence and, and of uh, the evolutionary process and, and the blessing realms. If you like, journey one, I call the entrepreneurial life. Um, journey two, I call the, the life within, the life in me. Journey three, I call the spiritual life, although I'm mindful that we are in a phase where people like to bash the word spirituality. There is a kind of a thing now that if, if you, many people bash the word spirituality to draw a distance between themselves and the new age, and I'm all for it because I don't see what I do and what I communicate to be new age in, in, in nature. But you have people who bash the word spirituality almost as a virtual signaling that they are scientific. So I'm, I'm happy to abandon this word. What I mean when I use this word well, I mean, I use the word spirituality to mean that we, we, we apply a meaning framework that's beyond the utilitarian here and now consideration, okay? Um, and if, if any one of us, if we think about, you know, how what we do today will impact next generation, as far as I'm concerned, you are within a spiritual framework and, and layer uh, meaning too, if you consider that, um, that life is more than this instance, and that when this instance is, is over, there, is still, there are still properties of consciousness and experience that, that will not come to an end, then you are exploring spiritually. And if you are sensing that life is more than things, than, than this iPhone and 
And even this instance, and that life is more in the in-betweenness, between us as individual, between us and things, between us and nature, if you're sensing into that in-betweenness, as far as I'm concerned, you're deeply in a spiritual quest, whether you like the, the word spirituality or, or not. So only in the last seven years, these three uh, traces, and let me bring this up, because I shared this on one of the early um, calls. I'll talk in a minute uh, about portals of perception and how it's to do with that. But this is one way I describe the three lives. Uh, this was a conversation I conducted with a, a, a brilliant 28-year-old uh, woman who asked my help in dealing with the chaotic nature of life and seeking balance. And I said, well, we really, and we unfolded this step by step and we looked at the life in the world, the entrepreneurial pursuit, the life in you, the developmental path and the universal life, the spiritual endeavor and the various uh, work endeavors that will belong with any uh, of these. Uh, so no need to go in, into it now. But so what allows me to speak about this today in this way and, and to muse with you about 2045 is because in the last seven years or so, I, I started to find a way to integrate what were very separate lives. And it led me um, two years ago, so probably quite parallel to your initiative with 2045, a few weeks after my granddaughter was born, I looked in her eye I looked in her eyes and uh, I, I took an oath. I, I took an oath that I will dedicate the next two decades of my life. I've felt at the time that I was successful enough. I've made enough money. I, I don't need to continue to work. Uh, but I, I decided I will do whatever is humanly possible for me to make the world just a little, um, a little more hopeful and, and brighter for her. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that led me to launch Portals of Perception with a group of friends where we are cultivating conversations about where the future comes from and how can we all be part of the co-creation um, of a better future. And it is in one way resting on the work I've done in the corporate space about which I wrote the book create new futures where I, I in some way re, reinvented, if you like, or reframed the idea of strategy work as, as the create new future work where I, I lead teams through the, the full enchilada of inquiry about their strategy, about their organizational culture, about the, the design of their products, about their innovation, uh, philosophy and, and strategy. That experience of the, that body of work that I've developed over the last two decades is one pillar of the inquiry in portals of perception. And the other is more the developmental, metaphysical, esoteric, interior journey that I've been on now for decades. And these two, if you like, create a, a, a space that is um, powered um, by these urgencies um, with very much uh, the, the cry of next generations of people looking at us, Beautiful. speaking to us today. Beautiful. So could you share a, a little bit about, um, and I so appreciate the background and, 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 and how the, um, the pieces of your history integrated over time, because I'm sure that a lot of people on the call today and a lot of people who will listen in the future will appreciate that journey. How, if you would, um, does, does that translate into the work you're doing as it relates to a vision for 2045 for your uh, granddaughter and, and, the, and the oath and promise that you made? Yes, beautiful. So let me first describe 2045 in, in this way. Uh, because I have to make it personal and I have to make it concrete. I'm going to be 86. My granddaughter will be 26. And I am committed that we did not blow this 
beautiful place we call Earth up, and that we have effectively started to, um, in a major way, resolve some of the crises that we are describing. And that in actual fact, Stuart, we are seeing the early days of what perhaps we future generations will call not another renaissance, not another enlightenment, because I think these frames are, are insufficient. I believe what we are looking at right now are the early days of perhaps what could be called a new axial revolution. So dramatic, so transformative. I believe we're looking at reframing society as we know it, which uh, you have been in, in dialogue about for, for several years through many of your conversations. So I approach um, this through five vectors. It, it would it be all right if I go down that path or, or would you want to interject and see no. Please, I think that that's, I think we're right at the, right at the moment where, uh, where I, 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 and I'm sure others would love to hear the five, the five vectors. Okay, so, so this is how I look at the four zones of Blue Endeavor. And we could start them anywhere to describe why the four, those four spaces, why those four critical zones are critical to enable the future evolution and transformation that, that I'm envisioning. And I believe that many of you are envisioning from different angles. And I will start on, on, on the upper left and go to the lower left and then go to the upper right and go to, to the lower right um, and, and define them. I could have done it differently, but I will begin here. Uh, because that has been um, very powerfully central to my formation. The argument of beginning here, and by the way, what I'll say is often when you get people thinking about the future, you will actually get people arguing with each other across these four zones. And I, to, be on, uh, to, to be clear on the front end, my premise is we need all four conversations integrated together. The premise of starting here is, is saying, if I am not rewiring myself on the inside and am not prepared to embrace a new operating system, I am not likely to even see and perceive and, and be able to engage in new ways of being, new ways of doing, new ways of collaborating. So the personal development space, and we could cultivate many different uh, spaces here, but it, it, it is obviously about the Know Thyself project. It's, it's about um, forgiveness and compassion and the shadow work that you will integrate to do that. It's about the, the character formation and the virtues of who you are as a person. It's about the discipline of mind and the practice of mind you will engage with in your contemplative and meditation practices. It, it is about alignment and, and uh, alignment practices and the, the multiple psychologies that are operative in you and about you working not just in your head, but with your body such that you are moving into the embodied experiential space somatically and you're able to balance and regulate the, the multiple energies such that you're not just a talking head on Zoom, but you're a fully living embodied person. So to me, that must be part of the future because when we describe the future, we will be talking about new capacities, new capabilities, new sense of self emergence. So we need to have that first song. But that by itself is totally insufficient. We've got to bring the collective dimension. There has to be an inquiry about who are we, who are we becoming, who do we want to be? And I think often in many of your conversations, perhaps you, you bring the gravity to this space. How will we heal and, and remedy the family space. There is such a breakdown in, in what families represent and, and what will the fam family structure be in the future and how will that continue to evolve? What about the collective values and ethics and morality and fairness, the place of rituals, the place, place of ceremonies? How will we truly unlock collectives that are able to be, not as we said earlier, collectively stupid, but collectively intelligent? 
So this is where I've done a lot of my work in the organizational space, both with corporations and over the last several decades with groups in, in the non-corporate space, more in the growth and personal transformation arena. And how will we truly build a society, a culture where mutual respect and harmony and peace inside peace is central to who we are as human beings and we cultivate organizational and development, uh, organizational development and, and health. So I think you're guessing what's coming in zone three. And zone three is the inquiry of what things are, how things work, the, the search for truth, the search to truly perceive what the case is, whatever the problem we are looking at, objectively. And I think it uh, covers many of the territories that you have covered and, and talked about. Because we live now into a, what some will describe as a postmodern insanity and madness. And that includes post-truth and post-everything else. So we need to uh, define and create new language and reassert logic that will actually enable us to hold conversation because the at the moment we have lost the capacity to make sense together. We have lost the capacity to create shared meaning. So there, there has to be an endeavor about reasserting science, but not in the Cartesian fallacy where, where science became the license to abort the all that was here on the left side, the, the intuition, the inner knowing, but we need to reassert the inquiry and the pursuit of truth through science in an integrated holistic way. And so we need to integrate brain sciences and other sciences with other intuitive ways of studying nature and, and the environment. And yes, we need to redefine what work is. We need to redefine the future of justice and law that some of you are working on, and we need to re-engage the space of evaluation and assessment practices. And we could probably place here another 20 spaces that are in the broad zone that I define as the search for truth, the search for those objective capacities, without which, by the way, if we only operate on the left side, we may find ourselves easily in um, intersubjective hysteria, sometimes or madness. So you actually need the functionality of, of a developed neutral perception and search for truth when you are effective in zone one of the personal development journey and in the collective inquiry. And naturally, zone four is Okay, so how do we do all these things and bring activism into the world? Because some will argue that all this is very nice, but unless we actually create a new education system, because that's where it all begins, that, that enable our children and, and their children to come inside new set of experiences, then nothing can begin to be developed differently. My argument is that you'll actually need teachers that are able to school and, and educate in a different way. So you need people that are engaged in these inquiries in all these three other zones, building a new education system. We will need new economic framework. How will we redeem the humanity from the forced uh, uh, growth paradigm that, that is based in extractive economy? where extraction has now been taken further into um, the internet by some, by some of the giants in, in the space. Well, you'd need to create an, an economic that, that somehow will work for all, but for that, you'd need to engage the, the moralities and the values and, and the justice and, and the, the logic that would reason that, and then you'd need to anchor it in, in governance and policy and new political sciences and geopolitics. And you need to bring into it um, new kind of strategy and decision-making 
arts and design and engineering, all of which need to be expressed um, by behavioral sciences. Now, by the way, those you could easily argue that some of the spaces here in the upper right are co-arising in the lower left. Sure, many of those spaces are co-arising in all four. Ultimately, what I'm proposing is that we need leadership, distributed leadership, that will cultivate engagement across these four zones of endeavor. And what I often find is you bring people that have a future orientation, and you have people that are more oriented with the activism end, what I describe here as zone four, and you have people that are more oriented with the spiritual and others that are more into the, the presencing of a collective vessel. And we argue across zones instead of recognizing we actually need each other and we need to cultivate and enable all four to co-arise. Uh, this was a long download. I'm going to pause here. And, and, and then if uh, time permits, I'll, I'll bring the fifth vector or the fifth dimension that, that's <laughs> implicit here. Uh, I thank you. Um, I mean, just as my initial comment is I, I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's a beautiful articulation, I think, of how, to, how we need to build from the ground up, starting with the individual human being, as, as, you know, as opposed to some grand vision, because the grand vision is only as good as the individuals operating in it. So I appreciate it. I myself, before I open uh, the floor to questions, would love to hear the fifth vector. Uh, and and I, I'm seeing some heads nod, and then people will be able to, um, to ask, ask some questions. But I, I have another question too, but I'll hold that until you describe the fifth vector. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me just, you said something so important, Stuart, about the need to start um, here on the upper left with the individual. This becomes even more critical when we think about cross-generational conversations, I believe not only do we need all people and all backgrounds and all talents and all capacities, we need all generations. And so part of what we are doing in portals of perception is we engage now in series of conversations with what I call next generation leaders. People that are inquiring along adjacent lines to the, the questions that we are discussing here today. And Part of what I am passionately and urgently addressing here, and which is why I honor and appreciate so much what you are doing in this in your collective space here, is we have a generational breakdown. The older generation no longer is ready to lean into the eldering function. So we have a breakdown of the, the generational transmission. And what you see with younger generations is, um, you see that they are missing the elders' engagement and are sometimes cynically looking at old generation and, and our generation, many of the people here into the 60s and beyond, we kind of abdicate or um, relinquish responsibility partly because um, we feel inadequate in the face of the complexity of the challenge, partly because we think it's gonna be technologically solved and I defy the, the technological, the, the techno-utopia, the, 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 the risk of the technology focus is it's an important part of the future, but it will not solve all the needs. We simply are suffering from the, the bias that we've been so shaped by the, the anchoring phenomenon of the last four or five decades, everything being solved by technology. We think the, all of our problems are gonna be solved by technology. Guess what? No way. We need to engage the human inner technology on the left side to um, address these challenges. And we need to do so cross-generationally. And we need to build the, the ways and means and the respect that will engage people in their interiority along different levels of developmental readiness. So, OK, so <laughs> Vector 5 says the following. The, these 
um, dozen or so civilizational crises that we very briefly touched, they are a byproduct, a symptom of something else. And what they are a byproduct and a symptom of, they are, they, they are a byproduct of the fact that humanity has been running on empty for very long time, for, for several centuries. The, 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 the whole run has been humanity and the human life, the individual and the collective being divorced from the, the realms, the blessing realms that ought to be part of the daily bread. And I mean daily bread here, both practically, but also mythologically uh, and, and theologically in the sense that it, it ought to be nourishing our souls. In other words, so much of what we are seeing in the world, I describe as, as crises that are a byproduct because we are divorced from the natural enhancements, the natural blessings that are meant to be part of a living, embodied human society. And I therefore reckon that <clears throat> we will not actually be able to purely just by ourselves um, uh, solve all the challenges we need to, to work with those blessing realms that are, are so nearby. And I, I need to put a caveat about the term blessing realms. I am not suggesting the two world mythology or the two worlds theology where there is another world that's separate from this world. This is why I describe that one way to lean into the sense of spirituality is the in-betweenness. So much of the realms of potential blessing is in latency in the in-betweenness. We feel that when we come together one-on-one -on -one and we step into deep mutual respect and a space of listening, and we are able to feel how we are renewed energetically when we listen deeply to each other. So the first event I conducted, first open event I conducted um, on portals of perception was the practice of active listening, listening with presence. And how do we do that such that it revitalizes and unlocks for us so much that at the moment is suppressed and held back. And what I'm proposing here, whether you work on family wellness on collective intelligence, on the new sciences, on justice and the law, on, on the economics and on governance, we will actually need to bring into the picture the blessing grams. How we do that is part of the inquiry and part of the enormous heavy lifting, but I'm suggesting we don't just need to do all the heavy lifting by ourselves. Life, the process of life, the process of genuine authentic e inquiry is part of where the heavy lifting is done. I ultimately believe that what is proposed here is the next new phase of evolution, the next 500 years or 1,000 years. And, and as a placeholder name, I'll call it Homo Universalis, where we transcend our planetary rivalrous nature to our universal capacity, chivalrous capacity, where we we practice not just win, 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 we practice uplift, uplift, uplift. And where we truly unlock the deeper human nature, where we become not just 10 times, but maybe 60 times um, wiser, more graceful, more loving, more lovable, because we are engaged with the toughest challenges of life, but from within a deeper tetheredness to purpose and a joining um, in the, the meaning of life. So I'm, I'm not describing here just some utopian thing that will solve all our problems in one go. I'm describing a genuine, robust endeavor of people on the ground floor in, in, in the trenches of life, but together working in spaces that are very difficult, like Stuart, you're working on the, the future of justice and the law. It's probably one of the most difficult intractable spaces. 
I'm suggesting these realms will need to permeate these spaces. These, these realms will need to permeate economics and everything else. And so that's why I ultimately believe we need to work and engage all talents, all capabilities um, in all four zones. And I, I commend you for the extraordinary intuition that led you into launching these 2045 conversations circles because I, I, I think, again, I, I don't know, but I, my intuition uh, and how it resonates with me is you, you are seeing, you're intuiting the next two decades as a critical transitional phase of the beginning of the next 200s or 500 years, essentially trying to off-ramp a civilizational collapse. And also, by the way, suggesting that evolution is not Maoist. We don't have to destroy all that was before to create a new world. I mean, we may leave this planet no other choice, but preferably there is a collective intentionality that will um, abort and avert such a cataclysmic breakdown such that we can engage in harvesting some of the good infrastructures as we give birth to new systems in every aspect uh, of, of life. I do believe, and then I'll, I'll close in, uh, this and, and let you all chime on, on this. This is likely to arise in circumstances like this. The, the traditional institutional seats of power, they are locked in, a, in the intractable game trying to hold to the old system. What we are seeing is they're becoming less and less and less effective. And the question is, can we ease a way such that actually some of those capabilities can be harvested rather than the system need to be completely destroyed? That is a very important point to be determined in the next few decades, I believe. So I'll, I'll pause here. Beautiful. Um, what I love about what you've shared is that you've provided just a beautiful framework or ground from which to build. And it doesn't matter you know, how cataclysmic events may be in terms of destruction of current systems, but, but you've created almost, almost in, a, in an Arist Aristotle-like way of creating a, a ground and a framework for rebuilding from the ground up based upon what we've learned. So I, I greatly appreciate your remarks. I love the word collective stupidity. <laughs> I, love, I love that frame. It's just absolutely wonderful. I want to open it up to some questions, okay? And, um, and I want to make sure that, that we leave you enough time to share a little bit about your project, Portals of Perception. But I'm going to start with my question first. I noticed the, the four blue vectors or the, the four blue vectors. And I, I can't help but wondering if that's got something to do with your background as a pilot. And I'm wondering how your experience as a pilot in some way contributed to the work you've done. Why, and why do I ask that? Because being a fighter pilot is sexy. Okay, it's, it's just, <laughs> it, really, it really is s sexy. Not many people have that, have that background. So, uh, um, so I, I don't know how you meant uh, the, the four blue zones relative to um, um, blue, blue sky, just blue, blue sky. sky. Like, okay. the, like the astronauts came back and they had pictures of Gaia. The blue actually has a different context there. When I tell the, the epochal story, I go through the rainbow of influences. And, and I use the color blue in a different context to the way it's used in several developmental frameworks, which we don't have time at the moment to address, but it, it has a particular context we, which we will leave out uh, from that for now. I will say the epiphany for me in the, the fighter pilot training was uh, earlier in the course, there was a moment when the chief instructor walked into the briefing room and he said, Get this. This is going to be a macho Israeli talk that, that at the time was uh, I, I was inculturated in. Uh, get this, everybody. Um, you're not so good as you think. We could have, instead of you right there, 
37 monkeys sitting. The reason you're sitting there are not 37 monkeys is because we've figured out in the Air Force that there, is a, there are better chances that you will not crash the aircraft. So the economic paradigm is simple. We will get you to graduate the, the, the pilot course um, in um, better economic equation than if we had a bunch of monkeys there. Now, it, it was a kind of insulting uh, message, but for me, there was something that got connected in a way I've never perceived before. I realized learning was never in a vacuum. Learning was always in the context of a window of opportunity. There was always a window of opportunity. I became so attuned to this idea that life is a journey of opportunities within window. And I, I've treated my life and I've treated um, work with senior executives. Always look at, at your opportunities in terms of the context of, of time, um, the risk reward opportunity. And the, like, I believe we have a risk reward equation to, to appraise right now for humanity at large. That's why we are in the conversation we, we, we are in. So opportunities and development and evolution is never in a vacuum. There is always the interception window, if, if I'm to use uh, Air Force uh, terminology. If, if you're making a maneuver, can you actually enter the interception window? And I think in the, in the, the, the largest equation for humanity, do we have a way to avert catastrophic uh, eventualities. I believe we do. I believe this is why we are in this conversation. And one of the reasons I believe uh, so is because I have to be, be optimistic and positive for my granddaughter. I cannot lose hope. This is not just me trying to sugarcoat the challenges in front of us, but it, it, it is a calculated, determined, uh, positive optimism. Beautiful. I, I can't help but share that. Um that I'm seeing my two grandkids for the first time in about three years today. And I'm, I'm really overjoyed. I'm overjoyed with excitement, overjoyed with excitement. Who else has a, has a question? We have, have a limited question. amount of time. Go, go ahead, Ken. Um, two questions, actually. One is that you've mentioned twice now, something happened seven years ago. I'm curious as to what that is. So that's kind of a personal question. And the second one is, this is stuff, thank you. This was a beautiful articulation. I heard a lot of echoes of things that I've I've studied here. I'm sure you and I could talk for many hours about this and we will hopefully have that opportunity. But I'm really curious when you're working with executives and they come to grips with the reality, you know, of just how bad things are. I just sent the World Business Council for Sustainable Developments update to Vision 2050 around to the Society 25, Society 45 list. It's grim in many ways. And so how do you develop in people the capacity to face this reality and not succumb to despair or to dive into despair in that initiatory process and come out the other side so that they do say, I can't afford to give up because my grandkids are depending upon me. What's your strategy for coping with that? Okay. So um, let me quickly address the first question and then address the second question. The seven years is probably simply a journey of maturation. There was probably an element of success in my consulting work and financial freedom that um, was acquired. And probably the, all the interior processes that I've been on for, for two or three decades reached a, um, a point of maturation. It's the curious thing about this. There are things you can project before you get to that point. And there, there, there were three or four years of confusion for me in that transition. Because for example, when you are to shift from scarcity paradigm to abundance paradigm in your life, it's one thing mentally thinking about, it's, it's, an, it's a whole other thing, actually re rewiring your system. So I could talk at length about the, the interior harmonization and the inner conclave work that belongs to it, but let me transition to question two. I think the, the, the definition I first look at is what is the circumstance I'm in? What is the premise of the engagement? And then what, is the, what are the needs of the, the people and the, um, the organization that, that, that I'm working with? And then how much can I stretch, can I stretch the envelope? And I don't necessarily see that in every circumstance, it is my job to give 
the the leader or the team, everything I think about and everything I know, I'm, I'm not there to quote Albert Schweitzer, I'm not there to change them. I'm there to offer pathways of possibility. So the modality that I lead with is largely a modality of inquiry. And what I have found is that when I expand the inquiry just a little outside of their comfort zone, and I introduce new possibilities, and I create for them in the choreography of the experience. I mean, really what I do with leadership team and have done for, for two decades is I choreograph transformational experiences. I enable them to move into spaces where they're able to discover themselves in and each other in a whole new way, in a way they've never experienced each, each other before. I do so by integrating a new inquiries and by introducing new frameworks and concepts. And then it's for them to discover in the playground, the, the, the new playground that we, we are facilitating. I'm, I'm not there to drive it into their heads. I'm there to help them relax, for God's sake, into a new playing space. And if they can, we begin to cultivate new conversations and the new conversations enable new possibilities. Beautiful. Um, I'm noticing the hour, the time. Does anyone have a pressing question? which says to me that you've just done a beautiful job of articulating what you wanted to share, Aviv. And we all know that we could, we could have hours of conversation about what it is that you shared. Tell us, if you would, a little bit about your project Portals of Perception before we close. Um, I'll quickly bring this one up. One of the key endeavors, this is the, the place, portalsofperception.org. Where does the future come from? And very much in line with the spaces that we just explored in those four zones, not unlike what we've done here, we engage in conversations uh, around different spaces and inquiries all the way from art and poetry and music and essence music to the kind of transformative change that we are uh, talking about. And one of the key endeavors at the moment is an, an open, free, collective conversation that we called Co-Creating Humanity's Future. Um, the first one occurred last November. The next one is coming up here on November 5th. And um, our deepest hope is that it becomes a place for cross-generational conversation. Then in other words, we, we truly enable us to learn from each other, to listen to each other, and to explore and expand our perspective in, in a whole new way. Uh, much more to be discovered, probably two, 200 hours of recorded content um, on the site by now, and we are publishing new content every week. Um, and you're welcome to uh, join the conversation and, and contribute to it. Beautiful, thank you. Um, and I went to one of the sessions and it was a very rich session. And of course, this is all um, um, Aviv's uh, pro bono work, um, which is lovely. So one of the things that's come up in chat before we close, and, and this does not happen all the time, but everyone who's on the call wants to have deeper conversation. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you'd be open for us to schedule a deeper conversation for for a, a, a deeper dive into some of the things that you've um, you've shared today, Aviv. Yeah, and absolutely. Great, and we'll 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 make that happen. But for now, um, I just want to extend my personal thanks for uh, just a wonderful presentation. Uh, greatly appreciated, Jose. You have something you wanted to say? I was just going to. Thank Aviv as well, and, and suggest that next week we have an opening uh, at this time. And uh, if Aviv, you're available, then we could use that time to uh, to continue the conversation. Um, I actually will not be available because, like Stuart, my granddaughter is is currently flying from Seattle to <laughs> to, to Fort Lauderdale. That, that, that family is going to be here for the next two weeks, and I am I am in the grandpa role. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Well, I, I'm actually glad because I'm not available next 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 week. <laughs> let's okay. let's let's cook on this, and even if it takes a, 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 a month or two to find the time, we come at it afresh, and perhaps it can be a um, 
a mutually sponsored portals of perception, Society 2045, where, where we exchange ideas and, and we actually build together. And, and rather than me as the main voice, it becomes more co-creative space. And you all share some of the harvesting of your journey over the last uh, uh, two years. I, I'd, I'd be interested in that. And I think it'll be uh, an important contribution to the portals of perception. Uh, Beautiful. Beautiful, because part of part of what we're doing in this is trying to be a little bit of a kind of a, 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 a coordinating, not even coordinating, but just a repository of everyone who's thinking about the future as as, as we are. And what I also appreciate, and it's more difficult and not always as popular, you are moving, I, I intuit, and from what I saw very much on what I call zone three and zone four, the search for, for truth in, in an updated way, the, the, the reestablishment of logic and science and, and so on, and, and the right kind of, and law and, and so on, what is work in the future and activism into the world. And I'd like to bring that energy and those perspectives and insights in a fuller way into the portals of perception um, network. So perhaps we can think about how to cultivate more. I perhaps would be doing the framing and let your voices come in and share what are the important discoveries and insights, and then we can mutually promote uh, this on, on both our platforms. I, I think that would be very constructive. Beautiful, beautiful. I have one more thing to say, um, just uh, to bring my voice in here. My grandchildren say, uh, grandma doesn't knit booties or babysit, but she's making the world a better place for all of us. And <laughs> they came up with that themselves. And so <laughs> I feel seen. <laughs> yeah, it's a different kind of babysitting, right? Yeah. It's, it's a future city. <laughs> Beautiful. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you.